I appreciate you guys all hopping on here this morning and hope you had a good weekend and uh, hope you and your families are safe and healthy. Uh, the Reichs were all doing well and um, it's, you know, we're just continuing to reach out and check in on people. So, and certainly hope with Colts Nation, right? Hope everybody out there in Colts Nation is doing well, safe and healthy. And um, hopefully we are, we are onward and upward and trying to be optimistic about uh, what's coming forward. Um, since, since we've talked, I haven't had a chance and I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the passing of my friend, John Tierlink. I, I know it's been a little bit, but um, John, I worked with him before and I, you know, all the chatter of him being the best D line coach of all time. I'm, I'm right on board with that. That guy was special. It was fun to be around him. I learned a lot of football in my first coaching job to, to hang out with a guy like John and not just professionally, but really got to know John a little bit personally and really enjoyed the time, uh, my here, my time here with him. So here we go, right. Uh, in the next week, uh, of, of virtual, uh, work with our team. I'm excited for it. Uh, the, the team's had a week off. Um, I know they've been working out uh, still, but we had a week off of meetings while we had the rookies. We, uh, we've had the last eight days, uh, not counting the weekend, but prior to that, we had eight days with the rookies. And that eight days was really spent trying to catch them up to the vets. So now this week, when everybody comes back together um, in, our, in our meeting tomorrow, um, we have the rookies pretty close to caught up. And they're not quite there, but um, so they can hop right in. And looking forward to having all 90 people on that call um, and continuing to progress together as a team and find ways to bond even in this. I know some guys are, um, you know, doing some stuff together where it's appropriate uh, with everything that's been instructed. So, um, you know, we're continuing to prepare, you know, really since April 20th, since this whole thing started as far as the virtual meetings, our mindset has been we're going to have a regular season. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. We're hopeful and optimistic that, that, that we'll have a full season together. Um, so our mindset is just to continue this preparation uh, with the hopes that we can start training, at, training camp on time and that the season would start on time. And we'll adjust as, as needed and uh, as told. So I'll open it up to questions from here. All right, Mike Chappell. Morning, Frank. Hey, Chuck. Uh, Again, you're approaching it like you're going to, like everything's normal, which it's not, obviously. But what problems do, does the virtual platform, I guess, provide when it comes to a value? You, you do what you can with the rookies and the new players, but a lot of players make their bones on the practice field, and they're not going to have that. Now, how, how hard is that going to be to, one, for you guys to evaluate that, and two, for these guys to prove they belong on the 53. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt chap that that's, you know, that that's part of the equation and it is, it's not ideal. Um, that part of it's not ideal. So uh, one thing it does do though, uh, to your point, right? You got to make your bones on the field. You got to prove it on the field. And, and every time you're out on the field counts, including OTAs, but always every year I've ever been in coaching, the same thing happens. We, we get through OTAs and we do learn a lot but we're still not in pads. And so, you know, we, we tend to get really hyped about some guys, but then as coaches, we all say, well, we got to wait till we get the pads on because that's when we really find out. So um, I'm not discounting the fact that we don't learn a lot during OTAs. Um, you get to, you, you do get to, but um, you know, we're just going to, we're in the same position every other team is in and uh, we're finding ways to do that. We're, one of the ways we're doing it is we're having guys send videos in. We give them like the drill of the day and I, Hey, tell your girlfriend or your wife or somebody or your friend to video you doing the drill, you know, get a few reps in it, send it into your position coach. We'll critique it. We'll coach you. We're doing little things. That's not near the same, but it's one little step that we can do, but that is part of the process that we are missing for sure. So, so one, one quick follow. -up. So what you're taking is that, that there will be some form of training camp, pads on before whatever's to come. You're, you will have some time with the players. I mean, that's what we're hopeful of. I mean, you know, what, what, when it was a lockout year, I don't remember exactly how it was. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of time beforehand. So I guess in an extreme case, um, it, it, you know, in an extreme case, 
it could be a few weeks and we're rolling. Um, you know, I think that's an extreme case, but uh, we are hopeful and optimistic that we can get some time in pads to get some evaluation done. Okay, Stephen Holder. Uh, hey, Frank. How you doing? Um, hey, Stephen. I, I think I remember when Philip signed, you told us, um, or you kind of referenced in a vague way, that um, obviously it's a one-year deal, but, you know, he has – uh, a, a vision of maybe playing longer, and you were kind of working under that maybe assumption. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I guess what I'm asking is, can you rehash some of that for me and maybe give some insight on what that conversation is and what your outlook is and, and maybe how you'll go about deciding that in the long term? Obviously, a long way away, but just trying to get some sense of yeah, long term. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I won't get into the contract negotiations only because I wasn't in those. All right. That's Chris's job. Um, obviously Chris keeps me up to speed with everything, um, especially on, on that contract. Um, so yeah, there was, there was, you know, it's contract negotiation, Stephen, right? I mean, we're, there's, there was some, no, it was a normal contract negotiation. There was push and pull on each side and, multi-year deal and this deal and trying to get numbers and everything to balance out right. And, um, and it finally just came down to what it was. Um, but I think the spirit of it was, hey, we're, we're in this together. And as long as Philip wants to play, he wants to be here. Um, it's the NFL. You know, we know he's got to prove it. We got to prove it as a team that he, you know, to keep him wanting to play. So, um, I can just tell you from the previous relationship, I, I really believe it's Phillip's intent to play multiple years. Um, I really, I personally believe he is more than capable of multiple years. Um, so, but as far as how the actual contract gets out, gets worked out, you know, that, that's, that is, uh, it's the NFL. So um, we keep things realistic there, but I'm very optimistic it'll be a multi-year thing. Does that answer it? Does that give you? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's kind of what I was looking for, yeah. Hey, Mike Wells. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Hey, um, Mike. I wanted to, you know, another question about Phillip. As you guys have gone through this process, I think outside of the rookies, Phillip may have the toughest transition considering there's no on-the-field work right now. How has he been in the, these classroom settings when you guys are doing things online? Is he, you know, pretty outspoken? Is he trying to change some of the lingo up? Just can you kind of go into details on how his transition has been through what's not an ideal situation? Um, yeah, he's, he's a very, vo he's very vocal. Um, you know, in the team, like when we're all on it as a team like this, it's, it's not, you know, no one person is dominating that conversation. When we get in as an offense, you know, Nick does a good job of, you know, inviting participation from everybody. Philip is certainly more than his share. Um, but then when we get in the quarterback room, um, that's where, you know, yeah, Philip has already had an impact in that room. Uh, a few suggestions, a few lingo things here, a few terminology things um, that, cause every year we clean things up. Like every year we come back and we see what we're going to emphasize and add a few new things. And so maybe we need to categorize things different, change up a couple code words. Um, Philip is in all those, all the quarterbacks are in those discussions. Um, and he's got some good insight. And there's been several, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I know there's been several times where we've just gone to him and said, hey, just tell us how you want this. How do you see this? Do you, are you good with this? Or do you want to call it something different? Do you want to look at it a different way? So that interaction is normal. And he's great at that stuff. Hey, Joel Erickson. Hey, Frank. Uh, Joel. What's what's Ryan Kelly meant to this offensive line as it's kind of formed and gelled and everything over the last couple of years? Um, Ryan's been great. Uh, when I first got the job here a couple of years ago, he was one of the first players I met. And I remember talking to Chris Ballard afterwards saying, well, that was fun to get to meet Ryan because if, if we're going to – I remember saying to Chris, if we're going to go where we want to go as an offense, then Ryan Kelly is going to have to – is going to have to step up and be an alpha dog. And uh, man, I didn't realize how much of an alpha dog he is. And he has been, he's been top notch. I mean, this guy has taken complete control of 
the offensive line room as far as the calls, what we do, the protection world in the run game. He's really, really smart football player. He prepares very hard. He's tough. He's got that personality. You guys know talking. He's got that deep voice, and he talks with a lot of authority. And he's, he's not one for much small talk, right? I mean, he just calm, barking out the signals. I just think he – I think Ryan breeds confidence. You know, I, I just think when you hear him make the calls, you hear it with authority, you hear it with conviction. I think the offensive line feeds off that. Everyone talks about Quentin, and Quentin is – you know, he is our inspirational leader in many respects. But don't underestimate the, the kind of leadership that Ryan is bringing. It's really – uh, several of those guys bringing that kind of leadership that's take that's going to take us where we want to go. Okay, Zach Kiefer. Hey, Frank. Hey, Zach. Um, from all your years playing the position and coaching the position, what is the hardest thing for a young rookie quarterback to learn about the NFL? What do they have to learn, and how do they do it when they're not playing the game, when they're a scout team quarterback, or when they're just getting reps in practice? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, having been there and like you said, having played the position and coached the position for so long, I think what happens with rookie quarterbacks is they kind of see ghosts. And what I mean by that is they see things that aren't really there. Um, you hear all the other things are true. The game's faster and there's better disguise. And, and, and then what the other thing you see is they misjudge how far a DB can break or how far a safety, what a safety's range is. And, and so they got to figure out, they got to figure that out. But I also think that they see some things pre-snap and they assume certain things and that's not always the way it plays out. So um, you got to, what I would talk, what I talk to rookie quarterbacks about is, you know, you got to be patient. Um, you got to, you got to understand how everything we talk about chunking all the time, right? So, one of the big secrets to how we teach, I say secret, but is this is just normal commonplace teaching stuff is, you know, there's 11 defensive players there. Well, really, if you chunk it together, we can put them in three different pieces. So you have to understand how guys are connected. And when one guy moves, what that implies about what everybody else on the defense is going to do. So part of our process is helping the, a young quarterback understand in this league how the parts are all connected. So that way, rather than looking at 11 different pieces, he was really only looking at three or four different pieces. And so that way he can play faster. And then he's not seeing ghosts. He understands how the integrity, the coverage in the front, how it all syncs up in this league and the multiple fronts and coverages that you see. So that's just a learning process and, and you got to see it. And like you said, Zach, they don't get all the reps. So, you got to get you got to get the those young quarterbacks watching a ton of film. Um, then it, when they get out on the field, they have to you know they have to put themselves in the play every time. And then I think you have to spend a little bit of extra time with them, you know, one on one. So we'll try to do all those things. Okay, Kevin Bone. Hey Frank, thanks for doing this. Sure. Uh, Okay. When you look back at your past defense the past couple of years, have you been pleased schematically uh, of how it's evolved, maybe a little bit more man last year? You know, obviously heavy zone is still kind of the core principle of it, but do, do you think that needs to evolve or will evolve at all in year three? Yeah, I think one of the things I'm really – I'm happy with Floos in a million ways. I think he's a great coach, has great demeanor, um, very disciplined and very strong convictions. but. Floose, like you get to know Floose and you see this really disciplined, strong guy and you think, you know, does he have any flexibility? Can he adapt or is he, or is this, sometimes I think we mistakenly think guys like that are stuck in their ways. Floose is not stuck in his ways. Floose knows how to adapt. He knows how to adapt to our personnel. So I, I see it the last two years when we get guys hurt or when certain pieces are, hey, well, now we got to play more zone or, hey, now we can play more man, or, hey, this coverage isn't kind of – we're not getting the production out of this coverage or this front or this blitz, so we're going to change it up. So, Floose, I think, is unique – or unique. He's the way a coach should be. He's got really strong core principles, but yet he's got a creative mind, and he understands it's about players, you know, needing to play those schemes. And so you got to fit those players in there and do what's best for them, given your core principles. And I've seen that – 
on a high level, he has that ability. So as we continue to add pieces to our defense, I think it's just going to get better and better on, under this scheme. Greg Doyle. Hi, Frank. Hey, Greg. So you're doing reps with the guy, online reps. What do Philip Rivers' uh, reps on video look like? Who's he throwing to? Tell me about this. Hmm. Well, I saw one. I saw one. Uh, one video. He had a he had a net out in his backyard, or actually, he had a net out on a field that was right down the street from his house. He was out there with his son, and he's throwing balls into the net. And, you know, and then his son plays quarterback, so they're they're alternating. So I got to see his son throw a son. That was pretty fun because I I knew his son. Um, obviously, know his son from before when we coached together. So fun to see how he's grown and developed. But Philip, you know, this this particular drill was like a check down drill, you know, where he was dropping back in the pocket, simulating movement, and then had a little net like it would be Naheem Hines checking out of the backfield and then boom, deliver it that way, then deliver it with this arm angle, working fast in the pocket, doing that. Um, so that's one example of physical tape that I've seen of him out there doing that, uh, that kind of thing. I think – Greg, what's going to happen if I had to guess? I mean, I know this is generally speaking the plan that at some point Philip will be moving here to Indy um, sooner rather than later. And then, you know, guys are starting, you know, more and more guys will get back to Indy. And then as it's allowed and we can get out on fields, it won't be our field. He'll get together with receivers. They'll throw with them right now. That hasn't happened a whole lot, but I would anticipate that ramping up in the coming weeks. And one, one follow-up, if I may, we, we know that, uh, you, you go back with him a ways. We know also that he's uh, 95 years old and has a lot of experience, but he's going to, he's already got his first job in coaching way before you got your first job in coaching at this stage in the career. No What's doubt. that going to be like to be in a coach in a room with the guy and he's a coach. Sort of. no, hey, he and I have been talking about this for a long time. Like when this announcement was made, I knew this five years ago. I mean, this literally has been in the works for a long time. So it's really exciting for me. It's really exciting for me to, you know, to see that in him and know that, I mean, I, I just love it. He just, he's football through and through. Uh, that just, we, and that's one of the things you love about him. And he's family through and through. So he's football and, and that really, his next step, and he has such a clear vision of that, you know, really just speaks to the, to the kind of person he is. And we're certainly excited to have him for, for however long we get him before he takes that head job. Okay, we've got time for three more. Phil B. Morning, Coach. Thank you for your time. Sure, Phil. Um, I'm wondering with today's what rephasing in of uh, the facilities opening. Uh, I know the restrictions, and one of the things there was that players that are rehabbing injuries can be there. <laughs> I'm wondering the status of, uh, say, a Toure or a Paris Campbell or anybody you're keeping an eye on. And secondly, I'm wondering if you guys want your players coming in or just stay put where you're at, keep doing what you're doing. Excuse me. Um, yeah, no, uh, it's business as usual. The guys who are the guys who've been hurt and who have been coming into the building, um, keep coming in and rehabbing, doing your thing. Our trainers have done a great job of keeping up with everybody. So keeping good progress reports. So, you know, I feel good about the progress that each one of our injured guys is making. Um, and then other than that, yeah, we, as soon as uh, we can get more players in the building, uh, yeah, we, we want that. Because, right, to make up for a little bit of lost time, the sooner we can get together and get out there working, the, the better the better it will be. You feel good about where Ture is? I mean, yeah, I do. It was actually a nasty injury. And you, know, you guys like that, you wonder about how quickly they can come back and – and I guess the way things are right now, you can't see him physically other than through video, but what yeah, about him? Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I do feel good about it, you know, because our trainers are talking to those guys every day. Um, I, I've been joking about this with the players and, and so forth, but, you know, we do these workouts, the players do these workouts, and, um, you know, and there's certain workouts that they have heart rate monitors on, and it right. all goes to the thing, and I can see all that stuff. and. So I get to see even the guys who are more advanced in the rehab, I get to see all that stuff there, uh, talk to the trainers every week, how's, you know, get the weekly update. Um, and I just, I think 
I don't know, maybe in this environment, maybe there's some strange way that there's no distractions. Maybe there's less distractions for the guys that are rehabbing. Like this is, this is my life. This, I know it is normally, but there's no other distractions in the building. I mean, it's, I need to get better to get ready to play football. So uh, maybe that could be happening. Thank you, coach. You got Andrew it. Walker. Hey, Frank. So I realize this is down the line a little bit, so bear with me. But last year we saw a pretty consistent trend across the league during the preseason, including with you guys, where the starters weren't playing a lot, a lot less than they traditionally would. Um, if, if there's a scenario where players aren't back on the field until maybe camp, have you given any thought to how you might approach the preseason this year with those main guys? It kind of seems like it might be a catch-22 type, type thing with what you wanted to do last year. Yeah, were you, were you on my Zoom meeting the other day with uh, Chris Bowers? Because uh, we were this, we were literally just had this conversation. We had talked about it several times, but Chris and I and a couple of the other guys, the coordinators, I got together with Chris, the other uh, the coordinators, and then our training staff and our strength staff, and and we mapped out. You know, we just I had a I had a plan in my mind for what I was thinking, but I wanted to make sure everybody felt good about it. So so we kind of laid it out. Chris and I talked it through with the group. And so, yeah, right now, I mean, I could, I, I know exactly how much I want the starters playing. If we have a normal preseason, that, that, that plan is already laid out. And I mean, it's no secret. I mean, I'd like the guys to play uh, in the first three pre. If we have four preseason games, um, I'd like the starters to play in the first three games like we normally would do. Um, same thing we would normally do, ramp it up a little bit each game and, you know, leading up to that third game and get them ready to go. Okay, Mike Chappell, last one. Yeah, Frank, uh, you guys have done so much in the offseason personnel-wise, receiver with Pittman and running back and tight end. You you sort of – I guess the question is, how difficult is it going to be to get Naheem Hines, that sort of unique talent? You only get 60 snaps a game. How do you maximize him while maximizing everyone else? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the art of it. That's the art of it. And, uh, I feel good about that. I feel like we're going to do that really well, really well. Um, yeah, there's only one ball to go around, but one of the things that makes it easier is our players are very unselfish. And so like, we know, we know how it goes that it, it, uh, Naheem could go a couple games with a relatively small amount of touches. And then all of a sudden he's got 10 catches in one game and, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a game this year that Naheem Hines has 10 catches. I mean, you guys know it just from talking to even Nick last week. Um, you know, Phillip has an uncanny ability to get the ball to the backs, you know, check downs and, and using him like that. So um, we need to keep Naheem. Naheem will be very much integrated into the game plan um, on all three downs. Uh, yeah, he's not going to play as many snaps. I wouldn't anticipate he's going to play as many snaps <laughs> as Marlon and Jonathan, but there's still enough snaps for him to be very, very productive this year. Very productive. 